Hi, Tacoma. Fifth graders, welcome back. Welcome back to your TV classroom. You might notice it looks a little different here. There's somebody new. We have a special guest. But before we get into that, yeah. let's check in with our zones. Okay, let's do that. Zones Friends. first. Zones first. Always. Before All we begin, right. today I want you to focus on your emotion zone. Okay, my emotion. So, how are your emotions feeling today? What zone are they in? Are they in the blue zone, green zone, the yellow zone, the red zone? And if you feel like sharing why, why? Sometimes with emotions, we don't want to share why, and that's okay. So teachers. Yes, Mr. Kevin. Can one be in the ozone? <laughs> well. <laughs> oh, Mr. Kevin. <laughs> I mean, sure. Sure. <laughs> Speaking of that, Mr. Kevin, what zone are you in today? Are you I, in the I'm in the zone? green zone. I, <laughs> I think you're more in the yellow zone. A little silly. <laughs> A little silly. <laughs> Mr. Patterson, what zone are you in today? I would say I'm definitely feeling in the green zone. I'm ready to go. I'm so excited to join you today to talk about salmon. Yay. You're so exciting. Ms. Asa? Uh, I would say I'm in the yellow zone. I'm just a little bit, this is a common theme this week, right? I'm just a little bit worried and anxious about forgetting things. I have a lot of just little things, nothing big going on that I'm worried I'm gonna forget. That's hard. So it's been hard. But, but you've done a nice job. Thank you. Well, well, it's because I have such a strong teammate here to support me. And chili with great ideas. And chili with great ideas. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling, Mrs. Wally? I'm in the green zone. Good to go. I am a little bit nervous that I'm gonna get the lines wrong on my input chart. But if that happens, wouldn't be the first time. Nope. And we'll just move on. We'll just move on. Yep. All right, as always, let's review the three personal mm -hmm. standards. Mm -hmm. How we all agree to come together so that we all feel safe thinking and speaking so we can grow as people. And they are show, show respect, respect, make, make good, good decisions, decisions, solve problems. problems. We don't have a phenomena for this lesson. No. We have more of a fun fact. Ooh. Ooh that Mrs. Wally and I learned this and we were both like, I didn't know that. No way. <laughs> oh, we need to introduce our guest first. We do. <laughs> Friends, this is Mr. Patterson. He works at the district office mm -hmm. in science. Yes. And he loves all things animals and mm -hmm. science. Mm -hmm. And he got to do a really fun thing. We're gonna watch a video about it and then he's gonna share his experience with us. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for letting me join today. I'm super excited to share all my experiences that I've had, and I got to go to a special hatchery and have a great experience, and I'm super excited to share that experience with all of you. It's gonna be great. I can't I, wait to hear. Our Skyline friends might recognize you, right? They would, might recognize yeah, there's, there's several students that might recognize me from coming in. I, I do a lot of stuff around the district. I do robotics. <laughs> Um, I'm big into Lego. Mm. Um, I support, of course, all the science lessons and mm -hmm. science materials and, and things like that. And coding is kind of a, my side job as well. And so, and nice. this actually hatchery experience, I got to experience all of those things in one place. That's what oh. made this whole experience amazing. amazing. Oh, I cannot wait okay, to let, show them the video. Let's okay. get started. Let's get started. The fun fact is, did you know that salmon do not eat after reaching fresh Water. This means after they've gone out to sea, when they come back, once they reach fresh water, they stop eating. Private think time. What do you notice about that statement? Mm -hmm. What are you wondering? Oh, I have a lot. What are you thinking? To know. This wasn't a just I wonder or and I think she needs I to know. know why. <laughs> yeah, and I'm wondering, you know, why do they stop eating? Because there's got to be a reason for why they stop eating. Because I imagine there's not going to be a good reason for me to stop eating unless, unless I'm <laughs> no, full. No, unless right. I'm full. Yes, right. Right, and but it's a long time that they're taking to not eat. So I well, can't imagine going that long without eating. And I'm wondering. I know living things need food and nourishment mm -hmm. to survive. Right. So I'm wondering, how long do they survive after they stop eating? Mm. Oh. Hmm. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. 
And it's not like they're just hanging out on the couch, right? No. No. They no, are putting they a are lot energy. of energy they're, and effort into swimming. Most, it's like most energy they're going to expend during their lifetime because they're going to have to jump upstream. Ugh. Have you ever heard of the saying, I feel like a salmon swimming upstream? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have felt that way for sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's review how science works and think about where we are in this cycle. It's a pretty cool cycle. It mm -hmm. really is. Is it called a cycle if it's, it's a process? I, I don't know, a process. Scientific process. process. Yes. yes. And if you notice, the arrows go all the different ways, which means you can be in one and like jump to the other mm -hmm. one. And so we've lived a lot in this top part where we're yes. learning information mm -hmm. and asking questions and gaining Making knowledge. observations. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to do more of that today. Mm -hmm. We're not moving down into that green part yet. We're not. Not yet. But we're learning a ton. Okay. So again, to review our essential question, why are salmon important to the Salish Sea? That's what we're trying to answer this year. Mm -hmm. Why are they important? And then later on, we're going to answer the question, so what can we do about it? Yes. But first, we need to know why they're important. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We just looked at Mr. Kevin for his big science word, and he had taken a bite of his lunch. <laughs> Oops, sorry, Mr. Kevin. We can, we can do it this time. He's got it. He's, he's got it. He's got it. He it. Okay. It. He's ready. <laughs> big science word. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Thank Good you, job, Mr. Kevin. Thank you, Mr. Kevin. All right. We have been learning all about mm. how things are interdependent. Mm -hmm. Interdependent, oh when, when two, two or more, more things need each other. Oh, I did it wrong. We did it. I did it wrong. Should we do it again? <laughs> yes. Let's do it again. All right. Interdependent, <laughs> when two or more things need each other. We also have been learning about the intertidal zone, mm -hmm. which is that shore area that's exposed between high tide and, and low tide. tide. And lots of amazing creatures and organisms live there. Mm -hmm. We learned about habitat. That's where these creatures live. Mm -hmm. And then conservation. Ooh. That's the act of keeping and protecting from waste, loss, or destruction. Right. Which because, is really what we're trying to do with salmon. Right. And we're going to go on a field trip later this week. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about why it's important to have conservation even where the salmon aren't living. Yes. Correct. We learned a lot about that. We did. Our new big science word is migrate. migrate. Hmm. So think. What do you think that word might mean? My. Well, me. My. Oh. Mm -hmm. It's with an I, though. Mm. Great. Great. Should we do the syllables? Yeah, let's. My. Great. Mm. Just do. Doesn't really help me know what it means. Mm. My. Great. My. Great. Any ideas, Ms. Paxton? Hmm? Do you have any ideas? I'm trying to think of where else I've heard that word. Mm. I know I've mm. heard that. I've heard it in terms of people. Oh. oh. But I've also heard it in terms of animals. Right. Okay. And so I, I think they're similar, um, but I don't know the, the exact meaning of the word. I, I think I'm like, you're jogging my memory. Something about them moving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking. Move. Move. So yeah. like maybe when animals or people move? Yeah, I'm maybe. thinking, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, a particular butterfly that's very Yes. Very important to us, and it, and it originates in, and has some birthing places in Mexico, and it actually makes mm. its way all the way through the United States, and then when it gets colder, it comes right back down to Mexico to enjoy that warmth. It's beautiful. Oh. It's a beautiful yeah. butterfly. Yeah, it's called a monarch mm -hmm. butterfly. I've seen a wonderful video about that whole mm -hmm. migration. Oh. Ah, all right. Migration means the act of moving from one region to another. And then Ooh. back again? And then back. Or does it have to go back? Or is that part of migration? Well, that's a good question. I think that's, that's a wondering that I have as well. I know that migration does tend to mean they go to one place and maybe make a, a cycle. Um, but I know in terms of how I heard people, mm -hmm. it's not always a secular thing. It's sometimes they migrate to another location to get maybe a better job, mm -hmm. or maybe they get mm -hmm. access to better resources, or uh, safe they're safer there, or things like mm -hmm. that. Right? So fifth graders, you're going to learn at the end of this lesson that we're starting a new thing using Flipgrid. And yeah. you're going to answer a question. But if you go on and find out for us, migration, or to migrate, is it cyclical, or can it be in just one direction? You can answer underneath the lesson 504. Yeah. 
and tell us what you're about. Us. Tell that would us. be awesome. It'd be so cool. Our sentence using migrate is their grandparents migrated from Ohio Ooh. to Florida. And actually, this makes me think of Mr. Oslin's grandparents who came from Latvia to the United States. So they immigrated mm -hmm. to the United States from Latvia. Now, John's, Mr. Wally's grandparents, mm -hmm. they are here in the summer and spring. They oh. migrate down to Arizona <laughs> for their, for winter, and then they come back. Right, Those, they have a special word for that. It's called snowbird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I don't necessarily disagree with it because I can tell you in the, in the winter time in Washington, when oh. you don't get to see the sunshine a lot, mm -hmm. it can really be hard. kind of dreary. Well, it can be. So, they grew up in Arizona, so oh. they go back to where they grew up, and then they come back up during the summer to be with their family, oh, great. and then they go back down to be with the horses and on the ranch. So, yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it's really wonderful. Good for them. All right, okay. We are going to show this amazing video that Mr. Patterson got to go do this amazing experience. You'll actually see a little piece in the video. He has There's a cameo. Can you tell us a little bit about who was with you and yeah. where Set you were? Set it up for us. Set it up. Yeah, so there is, um, we're working, of course, with salmon and hatcheries. And, and a hatchery is a place where they hatch salmon. And they grow salmon eggs. And then uh, they help release those into the stock so that we have more salmon for our animals and more salmon in our ecosystem. And so they have a special trailer that they have to distinguish between a hatchery fish and a fish from the wild. And that's really important for lots of reasons. And they'll talk a little bit about in the video. And that's something we can get into in a little bit. Um, but really, we went down with um, our amazing community partner, Julia Berg, at Foss Waterway Seaport and um, met up with a tribal member there at the trailer. And he showed us the whole process of how they deal with these Really, literally hundreds of thousands of salmon and trying to get them into our ecosystem. And those salmon, they're released in Puyallup and they make their way down the Puyallup River and into the Puget Sound. And so it was a really fascinating place to see where it all starts mm -hmm. and to see the, the whole process behind it because you've got to raise them from egg all the way till they're ready to go be released out and they're big enough and they go through certain stages in their life cycle mm -hmm. to be able to be released into either the estuary waters or out and eventually go from fresh water to salt water. We did learn about the salmon life cycle. Mm -hmm. What stage in that life cycle are the salmon when they're released? I think they're probably in about the smolt stage. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're definitely, I would say, you know, an inch or two long. Um, they're definitely got a little bit of meat on their bones. Um, and they start to get what are called like these fingerling markings mm -hmm. on the side of the mm -hmm. salmon that make, that's how we can really tell if it's a salmon. They need to have these fingerling markings. And kind of like if you were doing a fingerprint and you did a fingerprint along the side mm -hmm. of the salmon, that's kind of why they're called fingerprints. Um, and it was just a, really fascinating thing to see and they have this tube that X is out so you see all these salmon traveling through you're gonna see it all it's so amazing all right. okay let's, let's do it. it sound work My name is Grant Lee, I'm with the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. Right now we are adipose clipping all the hatchery Chinook. There's about a little over a million probably Chinook to get through. These are just the raceways all the Chinook are kept in. So this is our fish pump. We have one of these that'll go with each trailer. And it's just a really low stress way to move fish into our trailer from wherever. And less work for me, because I can just let it roll. We'll pump them into the trailer and they'll run through our machines. They'll get counted, measured, and get their adipose fin clipped off. And then they'll go into these two nature's ponds here. So there'll be half a million probably in this pond and half a million in the next pond. Well, these are Clark's Creek stock. So they just get released from here and they come right back. These fish here will return here in four to five years. We used to do everything by hand. And now we can do, this trailer has six machines that you'll see. And a typical day, I could do 60,000. We have a couple that are shorter. Some of the hatcheries are way more tight to get in and out of these big trailers. So we'll, those ones have five lines, but they still can do 50,000 plus a day. So the fish are out in the raceways. Then we pump them up into this tank. And then this will pump them up, up into here. So they end up in there. And then they go through these two 
openings here, make it measured, and then every click that you hear, that's one of these flippers opening up. And it opens up to a tube that sends them to one of these machines that are all based on fish length. And they end up in here. And they don't like being against this white background, so they'll all try and fight to get into this little corner. Fish comes in, it gets to the end, it trips a sensor, it'll a set of padded clamps will close down on it, and it arches that fish's back. And we have to sort them by length, because hopefully that adipose fin will be in that window. And it'll take a before picture, clip the fin, and then take an after picture. This was running pretty well, you might not see an error, but if it leaves a little too much of the fin, it'll fail it, and it'll get kicked into a bucket, and those will get done by hand also. Adipose fin clipping is part of a two-step process that helps scientists and fisheries identify and distinguish between wild salmon and hatchery salmon. The other half of the process involves the injection of a small piece of wire with a unique numerical identification code on it. So when we're tagging, that needle shoots the tag in like right there. And like if this is the little sinus cavity, the tag's only like that big. So you have some wiggle room, but if you can get it right in that sinus cavity, it'll stay in there until they're an adult. So like one length of tag would be like that. The tags are so small, you actually need a special scope just to see the numbers on them. These specialty trailers have really streamlined the process of tagging salmon for release. So many. I was there and I still have so many wonders. Right. <laughs> so tell us about the experience. Well, I, you know, it's really interesting because it's, it's, a, it's a trailer, an 18 foot long trailer, and, it, and it's got those tubes running out. So the first thing you notice when you walk up is you see these, the shadow of salmon swimming through the mm -hmm. tube, and it's really fascinating to see that. And then you go inside and you're like, this is such a mechanical process. It's all automated. Um, it, they used to do all of that by hand. Wow. So you can imagine if they had to do, like he said, there was about a million salmon there. All of those to have to clip the top fin um, so that it's marked as a, a hatchery salmon and not a wild salmon. And um, so you saw the process, what happens is when they, so the fish go up, they measure them, and there's, there's an algorithm or a coding program that's put in there that measures the length of the fish. Based on the length of that fish, it sorts it into those about six to eight tubes that shoot them down to the place where they can fit. There's those white tubs that were there mm -hmm. that were all the normal size fish, they can just go into there. But if they're too big or too small, they go down to that end one. And you saw the, the worker there who was manually clipping some of those. Some are too small and they send them back out to what they call the raceways. Those are the long pathways that have all the salmon in before they're ready to actually be clipped and they're a little younger. So they put the smaller ones back in so they can grow a little more and then come back and be ready to join the others. Um, and it was just, it was really interesting to watch them, that, that whole contraption that claps them and then just clips them and then sends them off their way and then they're down that tube and out into the creek. And it's, they can do, I think he said something like 15,000 salmon a day is wow. kind of their average for, um, clipping them and, and getting them out ready to swim away and be released. Um, the question I had is, I guess at some point, like when do they do a release? Is there a, mm. you know, like a, a time when they decide, okay, it's been two months or a month they've been in this pond and when do they release, when do they actually go and release? Because they're releasing all of them into a kind of a, it's a pond, but it's not anywhere they can get anywhere. So they've got to release, they've got some gateways and some other things that release them out into the actual stream that will t connect to the Puyallup. Mm. So I had a question about the tagging. Mm -hmm. Why do they tag them? Well, we actually didn't get to see the tagging. He explained mm -hmm. the tagging because it's a really fascinating piece of what hatcheries do is often they'll do the tagging piece because they want to track 
to see how successful the salmon are at coming back. So what's really fascinating is um, we, were, I, we had a meeting at, at the waterway with one of the hatchery guys, and he was saying, I'm getting a really good return rate this year. And I didn't really know what that meant. And he was saying the ones that they had tagged and released, he was getting about 2.5% back um, that were returning to the stream and hat. So if you can imagine those numbers in your head, those are really big numbers, and I'm pretty sure that's beyond our, our fifth grade math capacities at this point. But if you think a million of them and only 2% return, that's about 2,000. 500 that he's had returned out of the million. And so wow. it's a very small percentage because it's such a big gauntlet to survive mm -hmm. out in the Pacific Ocean mm -hmm. when you have all of these predators after mm -hmm. you. Yep. And you know, and humans are one of those predators, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, we we can salmon. go to the grocery store and mm -hmm. get salmon. And so that's why we've also got to be aware of how much we're fishing. And one of the things that fisheries have to do when they fish is they have to report how many hatchery salmon they've caught. Oh. And so that kind of helps them understand how the hatchery salmon are also impacting the humans' um, amount of salmon they're eating as well. Mm -hmm. Something I was thinking about too, because of all that engineering of that trailer, I'm wondering if it's allowing more hatcheries to be so they can get more mm. fish out. That's a great point. So each hatch, there's, there's, I think he said there's something like six of those trailers in Washington. And what he does, which was, I thought, a fascinating job is, you know, he works all around Western Washington. So he's going to go up to the Elwha, which is up on the Olympic Peninsula, which has got an amazing story connected to salmon migration mm -hmm. and salmon habitat. And he does that same process there. And so he'll travel with that trailer from hatchery to hatchery because that speeds up the process immensely mm -hmm. and they can get through a lot mm -hmm. more. Um, and there's, you know, like I said, six other ones um, all over and he travels with them. And so it was a really, you saw his, his depth of knowledge is amazing. And yes. the way he was able to explain things to complete novices <laughs> around this was amazing. He was really just um, very easy to explain things and, and um, talked at our level to us. And Wonderful. it was fascinating to learn the whole process. Well, I have a chart, yes. an input chart. Ms. Hassan and I found out from NOAA, which is the National Organization of Atmospheric Administration. Administration. Yeah. Whew. Whew. It's a tough one. I had to say it to my third graders this morning. It's a big one. So they teamed up with countries mm -hmm. all over, and they decided they wanted to track the Pacific salmon and see where the salmon go depending on where they come from. So we're going to do a chart, and I'm going to show you what they found when they tracked the salmon. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Kevin, can you show my chart? I have a connection, too, as you, you say do. that. I'm thinking of why would they, you know, the question of why would they why? do this, but I'm also thinking back to your words that you used before in the word conservation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if the reason they're tracking it is to think about what can we do to protect it or mm -hmm. save it, right. because our waters aren't as protected as our lands are. They are and yeah. so it's one of the things is tough to figure out who's responsible for which part of the ocean oh. and who's, and really, it's everyone. It's everybody. It is everyone. Mr. Kevin, is it possible to move the, our little picture down to the bottom? Certainly. That Because they're going to need to see that corner. Watch video magic Watch. happen. You can give me just one Ready moment just to, uh, to make that happen. I know, I sprung it on him. Sorry, Mr. Kevin. No problem. We've done that to him a couple times yeah. today. But at least I wasn't asking him to change them. <laughs> That's true. I've asked him to change them before. <laughs> right in the middle of filming. <laughs> it was not good. Totally fine. This is in my wheelhouse. Oh, that's good, because I would have no idea how mm -hmm. to do it. I'm so glad you're an expert in your field, Mr. Kevin. <laughs> we're going to learn about tracking Pacific salmon. salmon. Mm -hmm. so specifically to the Pacific, not Atlantic. There are salmon that live in the Atlantic, mm -hmm. and we're moving down. It's like being on an elevator. Perfect. So first of all, I'm going to draw the land so we can get an idea of mm -hmm. where we are. Mm -hmm. So this up here, this is Alaska. And Alaska is really, really important to salmon. Why is that? Because a lot of salmon were born there. And mm -hmm. we know that salmon always try to return home to their home stream. And so a lot of maybe the pictures you see of bears grabbing salmon yes. out of streams and things like that come from Alaska because the bears are dependent on that salmon as a main source of their food. Then this is Southeast Alaska. 
right here. And then in between Alaska and Washington is Canada. So we're kind of on the board, they're on our border. We share water with them, which would make sense that they'd have similar animals because mm -hmm. yes. the animals don't know that it's a different country, do they? No. Nope. No way, Jose. They don't care. They don't care where the border is. They just care that. Yeah, they and they live. and all along the is also where our resident killer whales live as well, mm -hmm. which are super dependent on our salmon population. And so that's one thing our third graders learn about is all about our southern killer resonant orcas and what they need to survive. Mm. And we talk a lot about conservation mm -hmm. and we talk about some other things with that. And then so. we get to the Pacific Northwest. And this is Washington, Washington, where we are. And then also, this is Oregon. That's where I grew up. Is it? Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't look. Look at all these connections we have. And then over here is Idaho. And I have a wondering about that. Okay. I'm wondering if there are any salmon that migrate back to Idaho into their streams. Well, there is the big Columbia River right. that can also connect to the Snake River. And mm -hmm. the Snake River definitely disperses throughout Washington, mm -hmm. Oregon, and Idaho. So, and so that's a great, great maybe. question. Yeah. So the Snake River is the border between, part of, mm -hmm. yes. is along the border between Oregon and Idaho. Yeah, and then the Columbia goes along the border and then mm -hmm. it starts to go up mm -hmm. into Washington. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna do the first pattern, which is the far north migrating Columbia, Snake River, and Oregon coastal steps. All right. Thank you for being patient while I write. Of course. Maybe some of you have actually been on some of these reserves. If you've ever yeah. crossed over to Oregon, you have to cross the Columbia River mm -hmm. to get over. It's that big river and there's a bridge that goes all the way over mm -hmm. and into Oregon. That's so the main way we know this. we're in Oregon. They went like this. Whoa! That is a big journey. It's a huge journey. Why did you follow that up? Because <laughs> <laughs> I already drew it once. <laughs> and then, this is the lower Columbia stocks. And what a stock is, is kind of just like a big group of fish. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's where we kind of say, where are these mm. salmon coming from? So they have I'm, a shorter route, it looks yeah, like. You know what I'm noticing is they have a shorter route. And I know I learned when we were doing our input chart that salmon spend one to eight years at sea. Mm -hmm. And I made this connection. And I wonder if it has to do with their migration pattern. Oh, how mm -hmm. far they go. long they're out there. Because if they're going all the way up here and back, mm -hmm. that's going to take them a lot longer than if they're just going like this. Well, and here's one thing that we haven't talked about that we probably need to. There's actually five different types of salmon. Yes, we're gonna get into oh. that. And each one of those salmon has kind of a different path mm -hmm. and a different length of time that they stay in the ocean. Right, and so another thing that was cool is this one, it went into two different patterns. Some mm. of them went over oh. here and some of them did the shorter pattern. Oh, interesting. wonder how they decide. I don't know, but I thought that was Maybe really Maybe they got stuck in the wrong lane? Maybe. I don't know. They might have. <laughs> they missed their exit. <laughs> missed their exit, oh dear. Okay, so then we have the Puget <laughs> Sound stocks. And those are the ones that are coming out of where we live. And you know what I found out the other day? What did you find out? We have SAMI students, which is our school that's right next to the mm -hmm, zoo. Mm -hmm. They're actually raising thousands of salmon. Really? In, a, in what's called an open pen out in Commencement Bay. Wow. And they're being responsible for it. And so I thought that was a really cool connection because they are contributing to these Puget Sound stocks. Oh, that's amazing. Right that down one. on Day Island Marina is where the, those pens are. Mm -hmm. Wow. I might have drawn some of these wrong, but we'll get the idea. No, you're doing great. It might be a cool place to visit. It might be yeah. a really cool place to visit. Thinking about, mm. you know, field trips and things. Mm -hmm. So then we have the northern BC stocks. And BC stands for? British, British Columbia. Columbia. Oh, right. I forgot to write them. I'm going to put them here. Vancouver Island. 
And some of our fifth graders had an amazing opportunity to learn from what's called Ocean Networks Canada this year. And they work on underwater technology and how they make sure the health of the ocean, and in particular, the Salish Sea. Mm -hmm. And they coordinate with Washington as well. So it's a really big wow. network of protecting our oceans, and in particular, our Salish Sea. So some of these come from here and go around Whoa. like this. And then other ones go right here. OK, I'm going to follow it. And this one goes both directions. Mm -hmm. So it oh. can go here or it goes up and around like this. Then there's ones that go like this, and then back down, and this one does this. Holy wow. wow. Look at all those different paths. But it's interesting how all of them kind of go in this like oblong circle mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and come back down where they started. Yeah. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? So I have a wondering. Wonder, what Why are salmon important? What were you going to say, Mr. Kevin? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, no. but I, I have a wondering. Yeah. And yeah. I wonder if some of our students are thinking this too. How do the salmon know where to go? I was thinking that too. <laughs> that, you know, I have, I have been researching that for several years. <laughs> uh, just kind of interested in learning that. There's a lot of different theories as to why that is. They actually think it might have something to do with magnetism and our Earth's polarity. And it kind of is their compass. Right? It gives them a compass oh. to their stream where they were born. And so they always go back to the stream that they were born from. That, is, that to me, is one of the most fascinating and things. Does them ever get lost? Well, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. You'd have to ask the salmon authorities on that. Like, I wonder if, like, that, if there are some that something happens and they get lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean. And I'm guessing they don't spawn if they get lost because they wouldn't know where to go. Right. They kind of the, get stuck and then it would. Yeah, and or who cycle. knows? Maybe they follow another salmon upstream, and and maybe they learn. Maybe it's you know, yeah. there because like you said, one of the things about we talked about the question at the beginning mm -hmm. of kind of why do they stop eating or whatever. I wonder if that's not, you know, what would happen to a salmon that didn't go up the right stream? Would they mm -hmm. follow the same processes, or would they, mm -hmm. um, you know, turn around and get yeah. confused, or or maybe they become food for a bear, or, or do they never? Yeah. I mean, it's possible that they don't. It's possible mm -hmm. that it's mm -hmm. so ingrained that they don't. Yeah. And who knows with, you know, there's so many things in the ocean oh, that yes. can get them off track and, you know, Eat different them. storms mm -hmm. and, and different predators and things like that, mm -hmm. that, you know, it probably can affect their pathway and which yeah. way they go, right? And I kind of had a question before I learned about this chart. Like, when we say they go out to sea, I was wondering if they just go to Puget Sound and come back. Yes. <laughs> but it sounds no. like they don't. They, they really go way they out go into really the far. Sea. That's a lot of swimming. Mm-hmm. A I'm lot. I'm not a salmon. Yeah. Thousands and thousands of miles of yeah. swimming. Wow, pretty amazing, isn't it? Thank it you so much, Mr. Patterson. Of course. Yes. Let's do some checking in with what we thought we knew. Yeah, and that was a lot of information. Mm. a lot of information. So think about, open up your journal to where you wrote about what you thought you knew about the importance of salmon in the Salish Sea. And see if you were right on some of that from what we've learned so far. Are there new things you think you know or new things you want to learn? Mm -hmm. Is there anything you already learned? We're going to give you one minute. Go ahead and work in your journal. on our chart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Come on, put it in now. So I was wondering if, well, I, what I think I know is that salmon are a significant food source for larger predators mm -hmm. in the Salish Sea. There's a lot of interdependence going on there. 
And then I started wondering, because I don't know much about this, but I'm excited. Interdependence. Interdependence, when two, two or more, more things need each other. other, about the cultural significance of salmon for yes. our First Nations. Yes. I am very curious about mm -hmm. that. And there are, there are tons and tons of connections. And it is, it is absolutely, when you speak of any of the tribes along this coast in Canada, mm -hmm. all the way down to Washington and Oregon, salmon is a staple of their society. They use it not just as a food source. It's a, a source of many myths. Mm -hmm. It's also a source of trade. They use it as a way of commerce, of trading with others. Um, they have lots of ceremonies um, that involve salmon and mm -hmm. things like that. It's, it's, it is a really fascinating connection to see when you have a, a staple species um, like salmon that are in the Northwest, and not necessarily everywhere, mm -hmm. but they're such a big food source um, and a, such a big source of life and trade and commerce, how much that ends up shaping the society around that. And that's one of the things as our salmon have depleted mm -hmm. that has affected our tribes a lot as well, is their mm -hmm. ability to catch and trap the salmon they need mm -hmm. as well. But one of the things that's great about all of our tribal nations is that they're very, they work very closely on sustainability mm -hmm. side by side with the fishing. So they're not, they don't overfish, they don't deplete the stocks too much. And unfortunately what's happened as our population has grown so much, um, as the world as population mm -hmm. has grown up and more people want salmon, is we've depleted those stocks mm -hmm. a lot. And that's why we have to have things like a hatcheries to produce more and more salmon because we're fishing too many salmon out of the sea. Mm -hmm. And then things like our, our orcas that are dependent because mm -hmm. our resident orcas that live right around here, and in particular, right up here in the San Juan Islands mm -hmm. a lot of the time, they are almost 100% dependent on salmon. They yes. won't eat anything mm -hmm. else. Um, unlike there's some other orcas that travel up and down the coast, all the way up into Alaska and around, they'll eat all sorts of things. Yes, salmon they too. Will. <laughs> but um, that's one of the you know the important things about understanding tribes and understanding the connections they have to mm -hmm. animals within their communities and things mm -hmm. like that. Is it's always from a sustainability lens. Mm -hmm. and it's always from a how do we work together and have that interdependence. Right. Interdependence when two, two or more things need each other. Right, and so that's, that's where you, you hopefully are seeing all these connections um, to salmon maybe in your own life and to others. And I, you know, the thing that I love about science and I love about learning about animals, every time I talk about them, I think I have 10 more new questions yes. circling in my brain, mm -hmm. trying to go, oh, I'm gonna go read a book about this, or I'm gonna you know, try and watch a, a short video about salmon, or because there are some amazing um, videos created around salmon and, and their journeys and the people mm -hmm. that are trying to make a difference for them. And so I'm always looking for new books and, and new resources. And I love um, artwork that involves mm -hmm. salmon yes. as well. So. And in fact, next week, our art teacher for the TV classroom, Ms. Teresa, I think she's going to be doing some salmon artwork. Yeah. 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 That's really awesome. Yeah. Great. So friends, what are you going to do with this information? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's your question for your assignment. What are you going to do? So on Flipgrid, your teacher has the link. I put it in the document for mm -hmm. them. You're going to go onto Flipgrid. And you can tell us however you want. Mm -hmm. You can do a drawing. You can do some art. You can write a poem. You can film a video. You can go on an adventure. What are you going to do with the information you've learned today? Mm -hmm. I would like to listen to our song again. Oh, yes. My can we please? Salmon. Quickly, because. Don't you have an appointment to get to? I do, thank you. Thanks, Dennis. <laughs>
tell us what are you going to do about this information you can write it mm -hmm. but I want you to have a chance to be creative because it's important to be creative ask your teacher for the flip flip grid link if they haven't yep. given it to you yet mm -hmm. you'll go on there I'm going to be on there I don't know if I'll be have a video or if it'll just me being talking but I'll give you the directions mm -hmm. and then you'll just post below oh I'm it's so excited so to great. see I can't wait to see <gasps> all of you should we do a drawing we could we okay Fifth graders, if you post on Flipgrid, we will take all of your names and put them into a drawing to win the Tracking Pacific Salmon I'm going to redo chart. it even better. Oh, are you? I'll make it look even better for Ooh. you. Ooh. You can also send us any of your work here at TV Classroom. Mr. Kevin, how can they do that? Well, fifth graders, just uh, fire up your email machine and <laughs> send us a, a note to TV Classroom at tacoma.k12.wa.us. Or you can always send something in the regular mail to us. Mm -hmm. Not as glamorous as Flipgrid, but, you know, it can be fun, too. Mm -hmm. So TV Classroom, that's 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405. Oh, now it's time for affirmation. Affirmation. Ooh, what are you going to pick today? I saw something. You know what it is? No. I can do something to help conserve our salmon. Ooh, that's a good one. Because okay. we can. We can. And we're going to learn all about that in the coming weeks, including our field trip to the Tacoma Nature Center. Mm -hmm. So let's all take a deep breath together. And say our affirmation. I can, can do, do something, something to conserve, conserve the salmon. salmon. Thank you so much, fifth graders. And Mr. Patterson, thank, thank you for you so your much. expertise. Thank you for inviting me. I yes. love being with you. It was okay. wonderful it was learning about Hopefully your Hopefully he'll come back. Yes. OK, friends, have a great day. Bye. I'll see you on Flipgrid. seconds to pick your crewmate. Two, a new timer will appear with an exercise for the crewmate you picked. Three, you will get points for each correct crewmate and exercise you choose. Four, you will get bonus points if you find Maui's hook. Five, if you pick the imposter, you will lose all your points. Six, use your math skills to see how many points you can get. 
good luck. Thank you.